If I'm honest, I wasn't going to make a video for the Blu-ray release for Core 2 for the Bleach Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. This is because unlike the Blu-ray release for Core 1, which released a year ago, there honestly isn't that many significant changes for us to talk about here. I can't lie, I was slightly disappointed upon realizing this when I'd started to compare the broadcast version to the Blu-ray version. Despite this, there is still a lot of demand from people who want to hear me discuss what changes have been made for this release. I know that it sucks, but don't get your hopes up too much because there aren't a great deal of changes for the most part. Our things are the same aside from a few changes to scene composition and lighting choices. Aside from this, I am going to be talking about how well the Blu-ray release for Core 2 has performed, as well as an exclusive interview between Kubo and Taguchi, which really does give us some important insights into the behind-the-scenes production of Core 2, as well as the pivotal role that Taguchi played in ensuring that Kubo was allowed to make additions to Core 2. So with this somewhat of a negative intro out of the way, let's get into the differences between the Blu-ray and the TV broadcast version for Core 2 of the Bleach Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. <laughs> Discover the Undead Collection and be amongst the very first to join us on our journey over at Getsugard.com. As to be expected, the Blu-ray release for Core 2 has actually performed fairly well. On the CD Japan Weekly Rankings, the limited edition Blu-ray release for Core 2 ranked at the number 5 spot following 2 days from its release. Then the CD Japan Daily Ranking, the limited edition for Core 2 Blu-ray was ranked in the number 1 spot. And lastly, the most important ranking to discuss is the Oricon Daily Ranking, where the limited edition for Core 2 was ranked in the number 4 spot. So these sales rankings are very similar to Core 1, which means that the limited edition Core 2 physical media release has been a phenomenal success. So the Blu-ray release is in fact split into two discs, with the first disc covering the first seven episodes, and the second disc covering the last six episodes, as well as some bonus material that they've included on the disc. This bonus material includes the preview trailers for Core 2, as well as the preview trailer for Core 3. And included with the physical media release is this incredible drawing of Uryu in his stern Ritter gear, drawn by Masashi Kudo, the character designer for the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. And there you have the list of episodes that are included on this release, from episode 14 all the way up until episode 26. And these are the two discs, with the first disc of course having the hilt of Ichigo's Bankai Zanpakuto, and with the second disc having the symbol of the Wandan Right Cross on it. The Blu-ray release also includes several different character art sheets, where we see the designs of each of the characters, here you have Yuhabak, and then Uryu's character design, and the various different important points of his outfit, which the animators need to pay attention to, with these reference character design and character art sheets helping the animators to draw the characters in the various different poses, and to ensure that the characters remain on model. You can see how much attention is drawn towards the chain of Uryu's Quincy Cross, all of the different poses in Uryu's face, and then the details of Uryu's Sternritter outfit, and then of course you have Hashwald, and then Pernida and Askin. You can see the additions made to the anime via the wings of Pernida, which we didn't actually get to see within the manga. And then you've got Bambiata, and we get to see her holy form there with the wings, as well as her zombified form character design. And we get some more anime original additions to the Bambis via Lil Toto, where we get to see her holy form too, which wasn't included within the manga. You've got Robert Accutron and then Meninas, and Meninas also has these additions with her holy form being shown for the very first time. And yeah, it's just really nice that they've included all of these as bonuses within the physical media release for Core 2. Again, more notable additions like the character design of Candice, which again has her holy form. I think they've included all of the character designs for the various different Quincy here. Here you've got the Quincy medallion and the different effects that are being used in order to visually convey how the Bankais are stolen from the different Shinigami, with this black cross and this blue light which steals the Bankai from the captains. Then after all of those character designs and visual effects designs, you've got these artboards here of the different backgrounds that we see within Core 2. The Blu-ray also comes with more bonus material via this episode guide and behind the scenes booklet. The episode guide briefly runs through each episode with some screenshots at the bottom with a description of what goes on in that episode. You've got everything from episode 
14 all the way up until episode 26 here. Then we've got the incredible key visuals on the right hand side for the Shinigami side. And then we begin the director's interview with Kubo. Now I do have a translation of this interview via a user on the Bleach Reddit called Shinizel. So a massive thank you to them for translating the important information that's been included within that booklet. So without further delay, let's actually dive into what Kubo and Taguchi discussed about the release of Core 2. So things begin by discussing the birth sequence of Yuhobak, which you remember was at the start of episode 14. So they say that we thought that we would open the second core with Yuhobak and link it to the first season. In the manga, Yuhobak's birth is depicted in the form of a folklore which is passed down, but in the anime they were worried about how to portray this in such a scene, so they had then decided to take some creative liberties and to take advantage of the animation medium and to visually show us the birth of Yuhobak without any narration or dialogue. Now the creation of Yuhobak went through many changes in the storyboarding phase and each time they tried to visualize this scene it was very interesting as there were several different initial drafts for this sequence. Both Taguchi and Kubo agreed that they wanted to use the holy chant Yuhabaha during this birth scene and they also wanted to link it to the first words of Yuhobak in the opening scene of the first season with him singing the Kaiser Gesang with his birth. Taguchi and Kubo then talk about Hashworld as they state that there were other depictions of Yuhobak's power which they wanted to show without dialogue, such as Hashworld appearing right at the moment that Yuhobak falls asleep, which indicates that the power has shifted from Yuhobak to Hashworld, and this switch is visually conveyed via the means of shadows. Within the manga, Hashworld explains the connection, but they wanted to actually show it within the anime, since this becomes a very important plot point way later on in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. So they thought that incorporating this switch of their powers early on in the story would be a good way to foreshadow what would later happen. So if you remember, when Yuhobak falls asleep, the shadow has a sliding appearance as it depicts the transfer of power from Yuhobak to Hashward. Since Yuhobak's power is transferred while he is asleep, so they had made sure that Hashward had appeared with his head down when he had received his power in order to preserve the fact that this transfer of power is linked to sleep. Now, following this, we then talk about Shunsui and the lieutenants, with both Kubo and Taguchi discussing how they had wanted to highlight the differences in how Yamamoto had led the Gotei 13 and how Shunsui is leading them. And they had done so by adding a scene in which Shunsui issues orders to each of the squad members. They had wanted to show the status of each of the Shinigami on the battlefield so that the viewers watching the anime would be clear on the ever-changing war situation. They paid particular attention to emphasize Shunsui's kindness while he was talking to Tatsu Ski, Keigo, and Mizuiro. This was really important because this is just the nature of Shunsui's character, and it highlights how Shunsui is doing things that Yamamoto would have never done as the captain commander of the Gotei 13. In addition to this, the anime staff also included new scenes involving Hinamori, Iba, Hisagi, Isane, Ikaku, and Yumichika in order to pay attention to the various different combatants on the battlefield. Now, these were characters who were robbed of screen time within the manga, so it was great that the anime showcased to us how they were faring in the war. They then go on to discuss how they wanted Kotu to have a focus on the Sternritters. But while keeping this in mind, they had to still remember that Bleach is the story of Ichigo. So while everything was going on on the battlefield, they had tried to parallel all of this with scenes including Ichigo at the very end of the episodes. Because at this point in the manga, Ichigo was pretty absent and he didn't appear for quite a number of chapters. So it's for this reason that the anime included some original scenes where Ichigo was undergoing specific training within the realm called Irazusando. In the manga, it was mentioned that Ichigo trained specifically with Ichibei, but it wasn't ever drawn. So Kubo wanted to include this within the anime. Now Kubo did want to include this within the manga, but he wasn't able to. Now throughout the entire time, Kubo had a very clear image in his mind about how he wanted to depict Ichigo's training. So he ended up telling Taguchi in precise detail, and he was surprised by how much extra details that Kubo had left on the table and didn't even include within the manga. The fact that Kubo was so willing and just had all of these ideas on hand had made Taguchi really happy. Happy. So Kubo did want to include all of the Irazu Sando scenes within the manga, but he couldn't due to the restraints of the manga medium. I mean, it just wouldn't work just showing Ichigo suffering over extended panels and then the manga cutting to different scenes of the Shinigami fighting. It would be way too jarring to have this within the manga. So thankfully, with the way that the anime is split up, they were able to include a lot of these Irazu Sando scenes as post-credit scenes at the very end of the episode. 
Now we learn that Irazu Sando is a sort of theater with its beauty. It is calm, awe-inspiring, and majestic. So from the designs that Kubo has drawn, you can see that there is a Shinto Tori gate with paper curtains and a stone platform. Taguchi admits that he would not have been able to reach this level of understanding if Kubo did not guide the anime staff regarding the meaning of what Irazu Sando is. The Irazu Sando pathway tries to push people away from the stone road the more that one tries to resist the push. Additionally, the wooden sword that Ichigo was holding also gets heavier the more that the individual continues to walk down the path. Ichigo literally drags his feet forward to not stray away from the stony pathway. Irazu Sando is described as a unique training ground that is not found in any other battle shonen manga, and it has a very beautiful but strange atmosphere with it being completely silent. I mean, personally, it reminds me a lot of the room of spirit and time within Dragon Ball. Now, what's important is that the images that Ichigo witnesses while he is walking down the path of Irazu Sando are very important, and Taguchi explains that these will be explained much later on in the remaining seasons of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. If you remember, Ichigo, while he was walking down this path, had visions of the mutilation of the Soul King. So Taguchi has pretty much confirmed here that we're going to be getting some additional scenes involving the Soul King, and possibly we may be getting a complete complete Soul King flashback. Taguchi says that he would be grateful if fans would re-watch the Irazu Sando memories and to pay particular attention to what happens within Ichigo's eyes. So rather than being sacred, the Irazu Sando pathway is actually cursed, but they paid particular attention not to tell this to the rest of the animation team because they may then depict it to be a very dark realm while they were animating it. The training ground of Irazu Sando is supposed to give off an impression of a very old, abandoned, decrepit, and terrifying shrine. They had a struggle with the story as they had tried to make sure that things weren't depicted to be too scary, as they wanted to find a balance between the terrifying aspects, but yet still trying to depict them with some level of beauty. So Kubo made sure that they could depict the Irazu Sando Road as Inca Hall. Inca means a philosophical seal in which obtaining the seal is considered to be the highest form of understanding of one's innermost soul. Inca translates to transmission, in which a student receives his teacher's philosophies. So if you were to apply all of this to what Ichigo is going through, Ichigo's Zen Buddhist teacher is Ichibei, and Ichigo obtains the seal from Ichibei. This results in Ichigo's soul being uplifted to a new level. Apparently, the realm of Irazu Sando is located underneath Ichibei's palace, and this is similar to how there is a massive training area under Urahara's shop. So we learn that the individual who walks down the path of Irazu Sando is not supposed to look at the stone path, but instead they are supposed to focus on the Tori gate that is ahead of them. Ichigo suffered because his gaze was on the stone, so the heavier that his steps ended up becoming. The Tori gate then turned whiter and whiter. Originally, the Tori gate was black, which represents the essence of Ichibei, with his character, of course, having control over the color black. Now the rain that falls outside of the stone path does in fact make an individual's body decay. So if Ichigo Ichigo ended up straying off of the path of Irazu Sando, then his body would have ended up rotting away. Now we're going to be talking about the color scheme that was utilized within Core 2. Now that we know that there was some controversy with the colors that were used, as fans weren't too happy with the red sky, but Taguchi says that they wanted the sky to be red and the buildings to be blue, because they wanted to establish that the blue of the Quincy's had completely overtaken the red of the Shinigami. This visually conveys how the Quincy who had been hiding within the shadows had finally risen to above the ground and how the pride of the Shinigami had ended up rising up to the sky in response to the Quincy. So they then talk about Mayuri's glowing clothing which appears in Core 2, as they say that they wanted Mayuri's clothes to look like the many coloured circuit boards that are found within gaming consoles. I think that they did an excellent job at achieving this. So then moving on to this, we then talk about the Bankai of Shinji, as Taguchi says that they used CGI for Shinji's Bankai in order to show the rippling effect of the pink and golden lotus and this is something that is typically found on the top of Buddhist altars. Once again, highlighting how much influence Shinto Buddhism has within the story of Bleach and the powers of the characters. So moving on from this, we then see the Bankai of Rose and Komamura, and Taguchi says that they used 3D CGI again for these Bankai, and this helped the anime staff to give their Bankai more of an ethereal feel. If you remember, at the start of Core 2, we see this children's pinwheel spinning. This pinwheel was drawn in order to symbolize how the innocent, peaceful days of the Serite were about to disappear, the very instant that the pinwheel would stop rotating. Of course, the moment that the pinwheel stops, the Quincy immediately take over the Serete. 
So they then talk about how they wanted to add a scene in which the highest ranking member of the Sternritter, Hashward, calls all of his underlings and begins to tell them orders. This was done in order to show how cold the Quincy faction is. They had Hashward sit at the top of the table, explaining very clearly what they had to do when he had told the Sternritters to break the very souls of the Shinigami. Taguchi says that they also wanted to highlight how powerful Hashward is as a commander. Moving on from this, we then talk about the Bambis, and Taguchi says that they wanted the Bambis to look like an idol group with magical girl transformations being included. You can see here the different character designs that Kubo had drawn for the holy forms of the Bambis. Now these are forms that we didn't get to see within the manga. So after Kubo had drawn these scenes, we were able to get an anime original battle between Ichigo and the Bambis, and we got to see them engaging in close-up combat with Ichigo. As similar to how Ichigo had an original battle against the Bambis, that also wanted Byakuya to have his own anime original fight scene, which was in fact off-screen within the manga, as we got to see Byakuya up close have a battle against Candice, Robert, and Nanana. Taguchi says that he had asked Kubo about Rukia's Bankai because he didn't understand why her appearance changes. So Kubo explained that an icy aura emanates from her Zanpakuto, and it's similar to the first dance of her Shikai. Rukia's Bankai is described as being incredibly dangerous, despite its outward beauty. So now we get some talk about the final two episodes of Core 2, which included the original scenes between the Zero Division versus the Shoot Starfall. So we learned that during the clash between Squad Zero and the Shoot Starfall, the anime staff's focus was on Uryu, the secondary main character of Core 2. Kubo Kubo was not able to draw Uryu as much as he wanted to within the manga, and Uryu was pretty much the star of this story arc. This was mostly because of the number of pages that he was restricted to per chapter, as well as the tight weekly schedule of releasing manga chapters. So in order to correct some of the mistakes from the manga, they had decided to give Uryu more of a role during this battle against the Zero Division. Kubo and the anime staff thought about how they could incorporate Uryu more during these scenes, and thanks to Kubo's incredible cooperation, they were able to create the final two episodes, which had so many different anime exclusive editions. Taguchi says that when they had thought about the Bankai of the Squad Zero members, the first consideration was whose Bankai should be shown. They had ended up deciding on showing Senjumaru's because of her name, which means a thousand hands. So they thought that she would have a fitting fighting style, which would allow her to face off against several opponents at the same time. Since she targets multiple opponents, they thought that it would be appropriate that the rest of the Zero Division would entrust her with taking out the powerful Shoot Starfall members. The animation team had proposed this idea to Kubo, who readily created the storyboards and visualizations of Senjumaru's gigantic weaving loom, and you can see the designs of Senjumaru's Bankai that Kubo had submitted to the animation staff. While these designs were not quite finalized, they were able to include Senjumaru's Bankai within episode 26 based off of these designs that Kubo had drawn for them. Taguchi was really enthusiastic about the final two episodes of Core 2, and he was really looking forward to the reaction of fans with all of the new changes that were being made to the anime. Kubo states that if he were to change things, then he would have also had Senjumaru battle against the Shoot Starfall. So when he had heard the anime staff make this suggestion to him, he had immediately accepted their idea. He feels that the animation team have a very deep understanding of his work, and he is very grateful for this. They're literally predicting the things that Kubo would have changed and done himself. So it was apparently the anime staff's idea to have the rest of the Zero Division members kill themselves, as they wanted to show that it was okay to die in order to bring their enemies down with them. Kubo liked the visual addition of how each of the Zero Division members' markings were erased when each of them had died. So we learned that Senjumaru initially creates a huge piece of fabric, and she lowers the hand handles of the sewing machine. As she utters the name of her Bankai, fabric emerges from the loom and an oval battlefield appears in the middle like a stitch or a knot of threads. Now gates made up of needle stitches begin to appear, and fabric begins to fill them on both the right and left hand sides. Kubo refers to this as a red battleground. Sanjumaru uses her cloths to do whatever she likes with the enemy. She is able to constrict them, cut them, sew them to their deaths, and her real body is on the outside of the Bankai. The incarnations of her within her fabrics are mere illusions. Her opponents become trapped within whatever coloured fabric that they touch. The only person who is able to leave the stage of Senjumaru's Bankai is Senjumaru herself. 
Kubo via this interview has highlighted how much of a massive role that he has played in helping the animation team and it's fair to say that Kubo is in fact a part of the animation team and Kubo honestly gushes over how familiar the animation team is with his source material and he talks about how the relationship that he has built with the animation team allows both parties to express and respect each other's original ideas. All in all, additions are being made actually by Kubo as well as the animation team, which to be honest is some of the most reassuring information that we've learnt from this booklet. Now the last bit of behind the scenes information that we have from the Thousand Year Blood War Core 2 booklet is in reference to Ichigo's Getsuga Jujisho. Taguchi talks about how they had wondered how to effectively show this within the anime, so Kubo had told them that the Getsuga Jujisho involves creating a horizontal Getsuga with the left hand sword and having this collide violently with a vertical Getsuga with the right hand sword. He states that it has to form a cross. Thus in the anime they were able to display the firm footwork and stance of Ichigo where one foot was in front of the other as he fired off the Getsuga Jujisho. So yeah that was the entire behind the scenes discussion between Toguchi and Kubo and it really does highlight their eagerness and excitement about making new changes to the anime. It also highlights how much of a difficulty Kubo had originally when the manga was releasing. We know that he had a torn shoulder, there were a lot of things that were left on the table that he wasn't able to include. I'm just so happy that he's able to now make these additions to the anime version and the anime staff are so willing to accept any and all ideas that Kubo brings to them. In fact it's not even Kubo bringing the ideas to the anime staff, it's the anime staff asking him and he has the idea is ready to give them. So finally we're now at the bit that you've all been waiting for and these are the similarities and differences between the TV broadcast version and the Blu-ray version. This isn't going to be very extensive, it's just a basic comparison so that you understand some of the changes that have been made to the Blu-ray because honestly I've not had time to go through every single second of the Blu-ray and compare it to the broadcast version but I'll show you some notable examples to help you understand what has been changed and the extent of changes that have been made. So you can see here this ice wall that appears in front of Basby, there's a minor change that's been made between the TV and Blu-ray version, with the ice wall being slightly higher in height in the Blu-ray version. Again, you can see it's just a very minor change that's been made, as well as more detail being added to the actual ice wall. Another change here where these soldat are aiming their arrows towards Shinji, and you can see the visual effects have been slightly altered within the Blu-ray version. Now there's a super minor change that's been made here, and it's when the soldat are affected by Shinji's Bankai, but in the Blu-ray version, version they've added small particles of Reishi. So this is the TV broadcast version, you can see that there's no visual effects around the Quincy Reishi here, but if you look at the Blu-ray version they've added these small special particle effects just to enhance the image. But honestly this is the extent and the level of changes that have been made between the broadcast version and the Blu-ray version of Core 2. It's these minor additions that you're not going to really notice unless you're really looking for them. Okay in this example you can see that Bambietta's holy form is improved within the Blu-ray version version, there's a lot more detail and pattern included within her halo for example, her reishi looks a lot better in my opinion, and once again the reishi has been improved within the blu-ray version with more particle effects being added. So this is how the tv version of the reishi looks like, and this is how the broadcast version looks like, there's no outline anymore around the reishi, and you can see a lot more particles and more detail that's added, but again in the grand scheme of things it's not a massive change, and it's nowhere near to the level of changes that were made to the core one release. Again you can see in this blu-ray versus tv broadcast version, the only changes have been small colour corrections and brightness modifications, but again it's honestly like trying to look at two images and spotting the difference but not finding any difference at all. It's really hard to spot some of these changes because they are so minor. Another difference between the Blu-ray and the TV broadcast is from this scene here including Kimpachi, they've zoomed it in and they've done some lighting correction too. Again not really a very significant change. So now we've got some Blu-ray versus TV broadcast comparisons for episode 20 and the first shot here you can see Gremi stood here with the cube of water that he trapped Kimpachi within. This is the TV version and then this is the Blu-ray version, you can see some of the effects on the water have been altered. It's a similar story for this next shot of these water particles here. The TV broadcast version, it looks fairly simple and then in the Blu-ray version you can see some more added detail, they've added more droplets of water just to give it that extra little bit of more detail. In this shot here from the TV broadcast version you can see the droplets pouring, in the Blu-ray version they've added a a lot more detail, you can see the ripples of water on the ground, so it's just minor corrections like this which are being made between the TV broadcast and Blu-ray version. Now these small additions are also being made to scenes where there is a lot of rubble, like in this TV broadcast version shot here, you can see the stones breaking apart and then there's just a bit more detail.
detail that's been added to the Blu-ray version. You can see a few more pebbles, a few more pieces of rocks. Yeah, it's honestly just really minor corrections. And also the shading on the rocks has been improved. You can see there's a bit more detail and light texture that's added to the rocks for the Blu-ray version. So yeah, they've corrected the lighting and everything here. Just made things look a bit more brighter and to make it just stand out a bit more. Another change that they made is this scene where Kimpachi's about to strike Grammy and this pillar has had a bit more detail added to it. They've altered the shading for it. So you can see the difference between the TV version and the Blu-ray version here. They've just made it stand out a bit more. They've altered some of the shading. They've just made it look a bit more brighter, to be honest. Then in other shots of this episode, there are such minor to no changes. I mean, have a look at this side profile shot of Kimpachi here and compare it to the Blu-ray version. It's minimal to no changes at all. This shot here has a minor correction to the neck here, but they've just extended it out a little bit in the Blu-ray version. This shot here where Kimpachi is releasing his Reiatsu, you can see that it's been improved within the Blu-ray version. Just some more effects have been added. They've added a bit of a blur to it so that the steam or the Reiatsu that is coming off of Kimpachi doesn't look as simple as it does within the TV version. So it looks quite flat within the TV version and they've just added an extra blur to the Blu-ray version just to give it a bit more extra detail in comparison to the TV version, which again, yeah, does look quite flat. So there's this shot here where we can see Kimpachi through the rubble and a detail has been added to the rubble in the Blu-ray version. You can see it's just some added texture just to make the rubble look a bit more better. And honestly, this highlights perfectly the changes that we're seeing between the TV and Blu-ray version. The Blu-ray has just done a great job with just adding extra detail, doing some minor corrections, fixing things that just weren't there in the TV broadcast version. But it's hard to really expect the animation team to do an overhaul of Core 2 and they're so busy with Core 3. Uh, I mean, changes like this, it's really nice. Uh, it just makes everything stand out that much more. Okay, and the final correction that I want to talk about from episode 20 is this shot here where we can see the side of Grammy with his hood covering his face. And again, corrections have been made to the rubble around him. Uh, you can just see that things have been made to look a bit more brighter. Some more detail has been added. While it was really dark in the TV version, they've just made it look a bit more brighter in the Blu-ray version. Some more changes here. The first two you can see include some lighting and color changes where we see the character of James with the color being drastically changed in a Blu-ray release. And probably the most notable change here is this drawing of Hashwald, which has been completely redrawn for the Blu-ray. He looked quite a lot more derpier within the TV broadcast version, but thankfully they've corrected this for the Blu-ray release. So some more changes here. You've got this drawing of Lil Toto here from the TV broadcast version, and this has been corrected in the Blu-ray version. As you can see, the drawing of Lil Toto's face has kind of been fixed via a minor alteration. So you've got some more changes here from the battle between the Shoot Starfall and the Zero Division. Again, it's lighting changes. So this is the TV broadcast version and this is the Blu-ray version. The scene involving Askin has also been changed. It's just a minor visual effects change, but this red bubble appears to be a lot more transparent within the Blu-ray release. So there's again these changes during Askin's battle against Karinji, where this green puddle is changed to purple and the continuity continues in all of the scenes where this green is changed to purple here. So during Gerard's battle against Senjimaru, we can see that the bindings that tie him down have been changed around within the Blu-ray, where they're given this glowing golden effect. Again, this is how they look like within the TV broadcast version, and this is how they look like within the Blu-ray version. So the TV broadcast version has also been corrected, where they had forgotten to draw the Shoot Starfall members in their holy forms, like in scenes like this. So this has been corrected in the Blu-ray with their holy forms being properly depicted. Again, you can see it here with Lil Barrow too, and that his holy form has been drawn within the Blu-ray version. Again, this trend continues here. During Senjimaru's battle against Gerard, the holy form is included within the Blu-ray version. And again, you see it here against Pranida's brief battle against Kirio, and there you have uh, Pranida's holy form drawn. So yeah, there are other changes here like Ichibe's face. This is the TV broadcast version, and this is the Blu-ray version. So some minor changes have been made, like the black within his eyes has been turned white, and his eyebrows have also got a white color to them. Yeah, it's just a lot more white and a lot more detail that's been drawn to this version. It looks really nice. It's rendered really well too. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, any scene where their holy forms were not drawn on the Shoot Starfall members, they've corrected this within the Blu-ray. So yeah, there you've got Askin's holy form there. So again, there are minor changes changes. All of these changes that I've discussed are from episode 26. But honestly, there isn't that many changes between the Blu-ray and TV broadcast version. It's either just a few compositing changes, or they've made scenes look slightly brighter or with more color in comparison to the broadcast version. Aside from the things that 
I've shown you here, there's literally no other changes. And I hate to be that guy, but honestly, it's nowhere near to the level of corrections that we got for the Blu-ray release of Core 1. I want to give a massive thank you to Perceiver, Naim, as well as Mr. Red Pants, who went through all of the effort of looking for all of the changes between the broadcast version and the Blu-ray version, and they'd posted these comparisons up on their Twitter pages. I'm confident they'll be posting more comparisons in the future, so definitely go and follow their Twitter pages. But to be honest, I'm quite content with the comparisons that we've seen and discussed within this video. While there are some minor changes that have been made, it's honestly nothing to get really excited over. The thing that I was really happy about with this Blu-ray release was the information that we learned from Taguchi and Kubo that I spoke about earlier on in the video. So yeah, while the Blu-rays are a great way to experience the second core of Bleach, don't expect there to be massive changes. But aside from this, there are a lot of extra things included within this Blu-ray release, like the character designs that I showed you earlier, as well as the art boards, the exclusive sketch drawn by Masashi Kudo, and then of course the interview with Taguchi and Kubo. So we've now reached the point of the video where I want to hand over the discussion to all of you. What do you guys think about the Blu-ray release for Core 2? In my opinion, it's a great way to support Bleach, so definitely go out and purchase it. And lastly, thank you for watching this video. Let me know all of your thoughts in the comments, and let me know if there are any differences between the Blu-ray and the TV broadcast version that I haven't mentioned within this video. Lastly, thanks for making it to the end of this one, and I cannot wait to see you in my next Bleach video. A massive thank you goes out to all of my amazing Patreon supporters for helping to make this video possible. If you also want to support the channel and see your name in the end of my videos, then check out my Patreon, which has loads of perks like early video access and so much more. Thank you for sticking around till the end of the video, and whatever you contribute will mean a lot to me. Thank you.